Well, when I asked our assistant or associate athletic director and women's basketball coach, Kirsten Moore, to speak, uh, she always thinks about it. And she looks at her busy world and her busy life, and, uh, and I'm so glad you said yes again, Kirsten. Let's welcome Kirsten Moore. Exactly. All right, hello, warriors. How are we today? Good? All right. Today is September 30th. And uh, let me tell you, this day has been circled on my mental calendar ever since last spring when I got the email from Ben and Colleen asking me if I would consider speaking in chapel again. In one sense, I guess you can say that it's been hanging over my head, uh, but not so much in a bad way, uh, like it's not something that I wanted to do, but more of in an important way. like. What am I going to say to a bunch of you that might rather be drinking coffee at Starbucks or sitting down on the beach or taking a nap right now? The first two times I spoke in chapel, I had some pretty powerful life stories to tell. So the bar in my mind was set pretty high. And quite frankly, I had no clue when I was asked what in the world I would talk about. So ever since spring, I've been praying that God would give me something of worth to talk about today. It was never far from my mind throughout the summer, but sure enough, August rolls around and still nothing. Yet, there was hope. I was heading to Africa with my team for a missions trip in Uganda and was confident that something would solidify in my heart and my mind as worthy of sharing with you all today. Uganda is a vastly different place than anywhere I had ever been. My parents had instilled in me an appreciation of different cultures. In fact, it wasn't long after they were married that they took off as passengers on a freighter ship out from San Francisco Bay, a freighter ship, not like a, like a cruise ship, a freighter ship, and they went across the Pacific Ocean and for 14 months they traveled around the world. Um, so I was raised on slideshows of these little negatives, you know, the ones that like are, the, uh, you guys, it's way too old to know what these looked like. Um, but there were pictures of them driving around Europe in a VW hatchback and, uh, or cooking with the natives in Nepal. And I'd traveled to many other countries um, prior even to this trip to Africa. But as much as you can see or hear about a place on TV or through pictures and stories, it still takes immersing yourself in the place to really know what it's like. The sounds, the smells, the smiles and hospitality of the people, the poverty, they were all extreme. Some were extremely good, some extremely heart-wrenching. All were extremely extreme. So in a new place, your senses are really heightened as you take it all in. In particular, something that caught my eye there from the start were the advertisements. Now, I have my MBA uh, with an emphasis in marketing and sports business, so maybe I have like an eye that's kind of trained more than average to notice these things, but to me, the amount of advertising stuck out like a sore thumb, and it was probably because of how and where things were advertised. So I started asking, because of what I was seeing, I was asking some locals, like, what is going on here? Uh, and basically, they explained to me that this is kind of what happens, is that someone from a company, one of these big corporations, that wants to advertise their company, goes into these little shanty like houses or a, a little roadside business and basically tells them, hey, we'll paint your house for free. We will do it for you. It'll, it'll protect your building. It'll make it last longer. And then they splatter whatever their brand is all over their store. So uh, this is what that looked like if we've got this so we'd be just driving through, so Pepsi, live for now. This is, I mean, we'd be going through the country and maybe they're only like, and just like one right after the next, just with these messages here, like more in town on a double story building. Here, this was like on the edge of a slum that we were about to go into in this little like shanty clad little building and they still painted that, Pepsi, okay? 
So that's what it, that's what it just was like hitting me so hard, like this is just crazy, this amount of messaging that's going on. So, um, but the one that really kind of got to me and just got me thinking about what I'm talking today about is, was one from Uganda Telecom. So it was like Ugandan's telephone company. And this is it. So this is just on a rural area, one of the buildings. It says Uganda Telecom. You cannot read what's under that right now. Okay, so I'll show you. This is one of their, mar uh, in, in town, uh, one of their storefronts. So Uganda Telecom, it's all about you. It's all about you. It's all about you. Everywhere we were going, it's like these Ugandan people, everywhere they go, they're seeing it's all about you. Well, halfway through our trip, we're on one of our long, bumpy bus rides through the red dirt landscape as we headed to Gulu, which is in the north of Uganda. We were on our trusty bus. It's the bus in the background back there. Uh, and Sam, our Ugandan kind of tour guide who works with sports outreach, says to some of us near him sitting on the bus, you know, when Jesus told his disciples to go into all the world with the gospel, you know he wasn't talking about the earth, right? So we're like, what? Explain more. He says, you know, the Great Commission. The word that Jesus used when he's talking to the disciples is different than the word used in Genesis when it talks about the creation of the earth. And what Jesus means is that as Christians, we're supposed to go into not just the physical earth, but into the systems of the world and redeem them for Christ. Now I'm sitting there and I'm like, okay, that is crazy that you just said that because for half of our trip now, I've been sitting here staring out this window at it's all about you, it's all about you, it's all about you. And I've been thinking, man, it doesn't matter if you're in the United States or if you're in Uganda, we're being bombarded with the same false messages and nothing could be further from the truth. And as much as we want to think that we're going to be happy if it's all about us, ultimately, what brings us joy is when we recognize that it's all about God and serving and loving others. Yes, he does love us extravagantly, but it is not all about us. That's a system for an unfulfilled life. It was ironic to me, actually, though, because we're literally walking through the bush in Africa to these huts in the middle of nowhere, which in evangelical Christian minds is like the epitome of the Great Commission, right? And here our local guy is telling us that the view of the Great Commission is way, that view of the Great Commission is way too narrow. Not that sitting in huts with those people is a bad thing and sharing with them about how much God loves them and encouraging them, but Jesus' command and vision is much bigger than that. Well, I'm not a biblical scholar, and uh, I do not have a background in Greek, but when I came back to the U.S., I tried to do a little research on what Sam was talking about. Sure enough, the word used in Genesis is Eretz, okay? And this is what it means, basically the earth, the land, so the physical being, and the word he uses in Mark is cosmos, okay? Which, uh, the, the definitions as I found in that was an apt and harmonious arrangement or constitution, order or government. So the way things are done. World affairs, the aggregate of earthly things, the whole circle of earthly goods, endowments, riches, advantages, pleasures, etc., which although hollow and frail and fleeting, stir desire, seduce from God, and are obstacles to the cause of Christ. All right. So, this was the verse he was talking about, Mark 16, 15. And he said unto them, Go into all the world, the cosmos, and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. All right. Enough Greek. In Matthew chapter 5, the great, uh, when Jesus is giving the Sermon on the Mount, he calls us to be salt and light to the world. Yes, that is the same word again there, cosmos. To bring Jesus' light, his way of thinking, his values, his love, the good news into all the systems of the world to transform them and to redeem them. So today I basically am going to try to keep this pretty simple and really practical. And I've got four ways and suggestions I think can help us in this really high calling. Number one. 
to find where your talents and your passions intersect and to go into that system. God has uniquely equipped each of us, yes, each one of you students, to go into different systems and impact them with God's truths that will transform, redeem, and save. <clears throat> Unfortunately, God's calling is not usually audible. Now, there's certainly times that that happens. Like, wouldn't it be great? You're Jonah, and God's like, Jonah, go to Nineveh! Right? Okay, pretty clear what he wants, even if you don't do it. It's pretty clear what he wants you to do, right? Okay, for Carly Storks and on her team, sit, on our team, sitting in a car, heard God audibly, Africa. Crazy, right? So it must be amazing when that happens, but this never happened to me. And so I think most often, God calls us into the world, into the different systems, through where our talents and our passions intersect. Hopefully, you students are in the process of figuring this out right now. Which classes stir an excitement about the subject matter? What areas do I seem to understand at a deeper than surface level? God is giving us the opportunity to be part of his transforming work through the systems. In other words, we are called to be missionaries. Some possibly in the way we typically think of the world, or the word as missionaries in the remote places of the world, but many others in business, in teaching, in computer science and technology, in music, in the sciences, in law, government, in psychology and social work, engineering, and yes, even right at home in your families and your social circles. A little bit about my calling. Ever since I can remember, I have loved sports. My mom's back there and she can attest to you that my first word was ball. I would follow my older brother around and play every sport with him, but basketball became the sport that really captured my heart. I went on to play college basketball. I was never a star at the University of Oregon, but was always able to use my brain and my work ethic to overcome what I might have lacked in athletic ability. And I became a contributing member of a team that went on and, and played in the big dance every year. And I was blessed also to be around some of the foremost coaches in the game of basketball, even the legendary coach John Wooden. So through my talents and my passions, God called me into the sports system as a player and then as a coach. Let me tell you about this sports system. It is more than a $500 billion a year industry. From peewee soccer to professional sports, it's infiltrated our culture worldwide and at every level. And talk about a messed up system it's become. On one end of the spectrum, we're taught to believe that you're only successful if you hold up the championship trophy at the end of the season. I mean, we have sayings like, there's no such thing as second place. It's the first loser. We've seen professional soccer players murdered for scoring an own goal in the World Cup. Some of you might know that story. Then, we've got the other end of the spectrum that says, everyone's a winner and gets a trophy. Yet, then, we're teaching our kids that they get rewards without production. The system of our sports in our world really is all messed up. And this is where God called me. With a vision that it could be done differently. With biblical truths that we could care deeply about winning. Because God calls us to run in such a way as to win the prize. Knowing that through this pursuit of excellence, God shapes us more into his image and we glorify God in the process with our gifts and our talents. Yet, we compete knowing that holding up a championship trophy does not define us, but Christ does. We already have the victory through Christ's work on the cross so we can play in freedom to be our best. Freedom instead of pressure. God's redemptive work in this system that I was called into. Number two, we need to filter everything through the truths of Scripture. So I've been reading the Bible fairly diligently for the last 20 years now. And 
I am just blown away, continue to be blown away with the wisdom that God's thoughts are not our thoughts and his ways are not our ways. But literally, his wisdom never fails. Let me give you an example. So I believe that one of the deepest needs that we have as human beings is that we all just want to be loved. We all just want to be loved. So what's our system of filling that need? We search for love in the things of the world. We think that finding the one will make us happy. We strive for achievement and success so that people will think highly of us. We obsess over beauty, thinking that then people will love us. Yet, these things still tend to leave us unfulfilled. But God has a system that meets our deepest needs. All right, I've got three post players and they're going to come up here and help me. They're tall so you can see them, okay? And they can really play basketball, so come cheer for them this year. But okay, so... Jesus comes along. There's all this stuff written in the Bible, right? All these things to do, don't do. Jesus comes along and basically boils it down to two things, right? He says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself, right? So now, in an ideal, unfallen world, number one just would do it all, right? It would fulfill that deepest need. God wants to fulfill that, that need for us to be loved. He loves us more than we can ever imagine, but... The bottom line is we're still like these flawed human beings that just can't figure that out until finally things are restored. It'll be all figured out one day, folks. But until then, we look at his second commandment, which is what? Love one another as we love ourselves. Now, here's the deal, okay? If Red is following, this is Red, by the way. <laughs> Lauren, Lauren, but we call her Red, okay? So. If Red is following these commands, okay, to love others, and she's not thinking about, oh, I gotta get my love, I gotta get, it, but I'm gonna give it. I'm gonna give it to Macy, I'm gonna give it to Morgan, okay? And Macy's thinking the same thing. I'm gonna really focus on taking care of Morgan, caring for her, I'm gonna care for Red. And Morgan's doing that for Macy and is doing for that for Red. Now, none of them are thinking about needing and getting love, but yet what's happening? They're all having their needs met, right? They're all being loved and they all feel that, right? It is so crazy. His system would work. His systems are designed for our good and for his glory, but we just keep screwing it up. Okay, go sit down. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. His wisdom is amazing. So filter everything through the truths of scripture. Okay, number three. All right, replace old thoughts with new thoughts. Okay, this is exactly what we see Jesus doing in the Sermon on the Mount. Right, okay, here's what he says. He takes these old ideas and he replaces them with new ideas. So, you've heard that it was said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. You've heard it was said, eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, do not resist an evil person. If someone strikes you on the right cheek, turn to him the other also. You've heard it was said, do not commit adultery. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. You know, President Beebe, a few weeks back, he talked here in chapel about Romans 12, 2, which says, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So here's a practice that I learned as an undergraduate college student at the University of Oregon through my mentor. And my girls hear it all the time, so it's not gonna be new to them, but it's this idea to fill forate it, or as we just sometimes say to each other, forate it. Okay, where does it come from? Okay, Philippians 4, 8. Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, pure, lovely, admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about these things. Whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. All right, so that's where it comes from. So, fill, forate it. All right, here it goes. Ready? All right, we're gonna just... Explain the concept first. Okay, everybody, I want you to not think of the color red. Don't think of the color red. Don't do it. Don't think of the color red. What color are you thinking of right now? Red. 
right, okay. So if you get this negative idea or thought that comes in your head and you dwell on that negative thought, you cannot get it out of your head. But what if I were to say, okay, we want to get that thought out. In order to get that thought out, we got to put another thought in. So here we go. Think of the color blue. <laughs> Novel idea, right? So think of the color blue. Now, you're not thinking of the color red, are you? No, we're thinking of the color blue, okay? It's because we've now put that new thought in, okay? Now, you guys, this might seem simple, and like I should be doing that lesson with my preschool daughter, but here's the deal. Three years ago, I suddenly lost my husband, he passed away unexpectedly, and this principle literally has helped me walk day by day through the valley of the shadow of doubt. <clears throat> so let's take it to the examples that I was talking about. The thing that was bugging me so much in Uganda, it's all about you. If we start thinking about that, man, we're gonna live a real different life. But if we get that out and we replace it with truth, what's the truth? It is not about you. For everything, absolutely everything, above and below, visible and invisible, everything God started in him and finds its purpose in him. All right, how about this one? I've messed up too badly this time and you just keep telling yourself that. I just messed up, I screwed up so bad, I screwed up. You are stuck. But how do we get that out? Replace it with truth. Replace it with truth. I am totally forgiven through Christ. In him we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. Okay, what about this one? I know here we don't have very many beautiful people in Santa Barbara. Okay, but I'm not looking, I'm not good looking enough. Get that out. Replace it with truth. I am adequate and worthy. I praise you for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. All right. So that's three. We're on to number four and we're almost out of here, guys. All right. And the last is this. Have conviction and courage in whatever system you find yourself in. Establish convictions that are based on the truths of Scripture and then have the courage to stand up for those convictions. I love this verse. It says, you are the light of the world. Yes, that is that same word there. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds in heaven and praise your Father in heaven. See your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. So you guys, here's the deal. The reality of the situation is that a lot of our systems are messed up. Whether I'm in Uganda or America, our systems can often lead us, leave us in the dark. And when we find ourselves in the dark, who do people follow? People follow the one with the flashlight. Our team just went up to Lizard's Mouth this last weekend. We stayed long after dark talking about amazing things. Great insight from my girls, pretty wise folks themselves. And when we left, believe me, we were following the ones with the flashlight. So when we find ourselves in whatever system that we're in and it feels dark, I hope that that can give you courage to shine your light brightly. But you need to hold on. What is that flashlight? Hold on to the truths and the light of Christ. Because people ultimately then aren't going to be following you, but they're going to find what they're looking for with God's transformational truths. Let's pray. Father God, I thank you that you've gifted each and every person here with unique talents and passions that you want to use. God, direct us into systems that fit those talents and passions so that we can be agents of love in your world. And God, 
Open our eyes and hearts and minds that we wouldn't see as the world sees or think as the world thinks, but that we would see where your gospel can redeem things for good and for your glory. Father, I pray that we would let our light shine in this world and that you would use us to fulfill the Great Commission. Amen. Have a great day.